Hello, Makers family. Hi, guys. I am Liliana Vasquez, and I am so excited to be hosting this very special edition of Makers at Home with the incredible Tanya Siracho. If you guys are not familiar with her work, let me just tell you a little bit about this badass. Um, not only is she a playwright and a writer, um, she is the creator and executive producer of Vida on Stars. Um, I think one of the best shows on television ever made. Um, she is also an incredible force in the entertainment industry, blazing paths for Latinx writers, creatives, creators, directors, actors, and actresses. Um, and she is an all around chingona, all right? Now, if you don't speak Spanish, don't worry. I'm gonna let Tanya translate what the word chingona means because she defines that word in the best way possible. So without further ado, let's get in. There she is. Hola. Wait, Hola, let me get amigas. further away. Hola. <laughs> Oh, wait. Okay, I feel like I should say, like, what, what do they say in London in the morning? Like, good day, mates, Australian. What do they say over there? Like, top of the morning to you? I just say, you know what I do? I do a lot of texting at Buenos Dias. I'm just trying to get them to my, to my level. You know what I mean? Um, oh. So, you guys, for all of you that are just joining us, welcome to Makers at Home. My name is Liliana Vasquez. I'm filling in for Dylan McGee today, and with me is the incredible Tanya Saracho. She is joining us from the other side of the pond. You're in London, correct? I am. Yeah, in uh, an Airbnb. So this is not my usual house. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. And Tanya, we are so excited. I um, wanted to actually speak with you during Hispanic Heritage Month yeah. of Makers. We were honoring incredible women that really are driving and affecting change in the world to create a better, um, more equitable space for all Latinos and Latinas um, in different industries. And you, we're at the top of my list because what you have managed to do in such a short period of time is incredible. It gives me goosebumps and it makes me so hopeful for the future of not just the ind industry that you and I both love and share, but for this entire community. So um, tell me a little bit about your background. We're both Tejanas. You're, you grew up on the border, McAllen, Texas the border. girl. Border um, girl, yeah. I grew up in Fort Worth. And, and I have to say that growing up um, as a Mexican in Texas is, is incredibly informative. Um, and it shapes who we are in the world today, especially when you leave Texas and you go on to work in LA or, or New York or, or London and you become a global citizen. So I want to know, how did your childhood and growing up Mexicana in a border town impact who you are today? Well, I do think that being a border girl, like be, growing up in a border town, you navigated something different than like uh, up north in Texas, you know, because like mm -hmm. you could still pay in pesos, you could still speak Spanish or Spanglish. Like it was like uh, um, you, you you walked around with two tongues, two cultures, but it was it, it, in a weird way, there was synergy. It's when mm -hmm. I went to school in Boston University that I it's the first time I realized I was Latina and it was like an umbrella term and I was brown. It was a whole like a, a like fast culture clash learning that I didn't get in the, in the on the border because my dad, he worked in Reynosa and mm -hmm. we lived in McAllen. So like it was this like porous existence, especially back then. Now it's not right. so porous. It's harder to, you know, right. but, um, but then it's when I went to Boston that I was like all these uh, people who had, terminology for me, you know, well, Hispanic or, or in the East Coast, they call them Spanish girl. She's a Spanish girl. No, wait, I'm Mexican. But uh, they mean, right. I speak Spanish, you know, all that. Uh, uh, I, as a, when I got up there is the first time I, I heard the term Chicano. I hadn't yeah. heard it in Texas, not in South Texas, you know, right? All that stuff. Like, and then, you know, you're young, going to college and defining yourself also in other ways, you know, my queerness, all that stuff. And then also like my Latinidad, the notion of Latinidad, no more Mexicanness. It was right. Latinidad. And, and that, I mean, that's something I'm still unpacking now. When I moved to Chicago, um, the first night I was in my uh, apartment, these girls from upstairs that were doing a residency to be doctors, like they shared like some iced tea with us. We were on the porch. It was like warm enough in Chicago. And um, they were doing the lay of the land. And they were like, okay, over there, there's some black people. And over there, there's some Mexicans. And I, I had never... Heard me like she didn't say a, she just said Mexicans, but how she said it, and yeah. I, I think she saw my face, my reaction. She was like, "Oh, are 
are you are Mexican? And I go, yes. And she was like, oh, the other kind of Mexicans, she said, are over there. And I think I've yeah. spent my life, my creative life unpacking that. Like, what, what does that girl mean? What does Latinidad mean? Like, like just that experience in Chicago, I'm I feel like I'm still unpacking, you know? Like, yeah. there's these versions of us. No, there is. And I also always said, you know, I grew up thinking that all Latinos were Mexican. Like, right, that right. Was, in Texas. That, was, that yeah. was my world. Like, my dad was Puerto Rican, but we just absorbed him oh, into right. our Mexican family. You know right. what I mean? Like, he yeah. was as a, he was more American than Puerto Rican because he was schooled here and raised here. And so we just took him in. We're like, oh, he's Puerto Rican, but he's really like Mexican. You yeah. Know? And, you know, everything we were, Texas is just northern Mexico. I mean, that's ki kind of... I mean, of... that's what it used to be. <laughs> exactly. <so yeah. laughs> we're all Mexican. We're just north of Coahuila, of Coahuila you know? Yeah. And for me, I think, like you, my, my real eye-opening and almost kind of like my introduction into this idea of Latinidad did come when I went to George Washington University. And it's interesting, but you and I have similar trajectories. We left Texas and we went to a big East Coast city. East Coast, yeah. East Coast. And all of a sudden you're like, wait, what, what, is, what is the Mexican, what is this Mexican thing happening? Yeah. Because it's just life and it's all around me. But then people are like, oh, you're Mexican? Question mark. Not just like, oh, you're Mexican. Like everybody else is in Texas. And I do think Well, the that context changes, right? Yeah. Close yeah. to the Mexico, you have a content, but then it gets just more negative. I don't know why, like the north you, more north you get. Yeah, so. Abs ab no, no, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that that constantly shifting and forming identity it, it, is, is something that for me, like you said, I'm still a work in progress around yeah. all of that and we're unpacking. But what I see in you is an ability to own that with such confidence and, and you know, when I see it expressed, you know, in your written word, or when I see it expressed on television, it's, it's brilliant. And it feels like the first time that I'm seen by somebody who has actually lived my experience. How important is honoring that identity in your creative work for people that are, you know, wanting to be writers or creators or artists? Like, how much of that is, is part of the work that you put out there for us to enjoy? Well, first of all, I want to say I'm glad you think that I'm like confident and stuff because as like, you know, I'm one of those like insecure writers that are always like, oh, I don't think no. I do, but the writing doesn't end up like the writing ends up being what it, you know, it, but like the process is all because that's I'm in process right now. And I'm like, oh, my God, do I even know how to do this? So it's, it's funny <laughs> that you said that. But, um, but the, the uh, you know, representing us is everything to me. I'm trying to I just got a, a you know, I just got a new home at uh, Universal Content, um, and that's why I got a new deal. Yeah, I'm so excited, and they are letting me build a slate of shows. Hopefully, si Dios quiere. Si Dios quiere, voy a si tener la vela. Ya tengo toca, la vela. Toca madera. Yep. Este, uh, uh, shows that are because I don't think we've had enough stories in the you know in the landscape uh, that that would, I would ever limit myself. Meaning we have so many stories to tell, you know? There's 27 countries that make up the Latin diaspora. They're, we're never gonna run out of stories, you know? Never. So I, right now, everything, all like, you know, sort of seven things we're trying to develop are all about us for us in that way, but like in that complicated way that, we, like some are historical, some are genre, some are, you know? Um, but we, we can be at the center of those narratives. We deserve to be, because in real life we are. I mean, Absolutely. if you look at who's, you know, healing and curing us during the, you know, the COVID, it's us, you it's know, us. who's, yeah. who's, uh, you know, the, the wildfires, who's like, it's us, like, it, yeah. like in every, every aspect of American life, it's us. It's just that we, I don't know why we don't end up in the narrative of that, like in the, the retelling of it. It's, it really, I, I haven't, I know why, I know why. <laughs> Tell me why. I know why. Um, this is just one of the reasons, but, you know, having worked in, in mainstream media and news, I can tell you it's because there's not enough of us to represent our stories authentically yeah. yet. Yeah. And women like you are changing that. And it's why I admire you so much because you're not just doing this, you know, with actors and actresses in front of the camera, which by the way, is so important, yes. but, yeah. but you are doing the work behind the scenes. And you always say something, you, you say that you want stories 
about us by us. Yeah, no that, stories about us without us. Yeah. No stories about us without, without us. us. Yeah. And I remember reading that and thinking, that is why when I watch Viva, I connect to that show in a way that I had never before with a show on television. And I think of last year as such an incredible and pivotal year for me for television. I am a TV fan. I've always been a TV. I will watch anything and everything. I'm not embarrassed about my reality TV addiction. <laughs> yeah, no, I am you. like yeah. a highbrow, lowbrow, everything. Docu-series, reality, fiction, comedy, sitcom. I watch it all. And in my 39 years of, of TV viewing, because I came out of the womb with a television. You watch it, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, I got two series in one year. I got Vida from you, and I got Gente Fat. Yeah. And that was the first year in my life as a fiercely proud Latina that I ever watched TV and saw the stories that I lived and I experienced reflected so beautifully on television in a way that made me so proud. For the first time, I wasn't looking at just like another stereotypical version of me. Am I a gardener? Yeah. Am I a maid? Am I a, do, am I a drug cartel? Um, player? Am I married to the guy that runs the drug cartel? And yeah. nothing against those stories. But like you said, we're at the center of so many different narratives. Right. And those Why? have not been held by us, right? No, the dominant no. culture has been guiding our narrative, which is really, it's like kind of like cultural Monsanto when you like consume something that somebody else has made about you, you mm -hmm. consume it about yourself and you start to believe it. It is really damaging to the culture to be like, we are only those things. It, because exactly. You, you confuse. You know you're not. You know you're not just uh, cartels or, or mates, which we, we are those things. It's important to know. Like, we are those yep. things. But, when, but in, in, in a way, we've been, like, stereotyped and fetishized to just be those things. And, the, like, mm -hmm. and, and it, it's really damaging to a culture. Um, the Annenberg is coming up with some um, study that's saying the cartel narrative is the most damaging culture to you know I mean, I uh, a narrative to our culture you know and you see it the way you know like 71 think, million people in this country think about us meaning yeah. like you know like they well, have that then, opinion of us of course because that's the image that you put out and, and they fetishize that image yeah. and and yeah. that's that's bad and that's why vida is so important and to me was just such a pivotal turning point in how i wanted to see myself on screen how i wanted to see my community on screen so can we talk about Vida? Because I want to know I when it. you took that meeting and you got the green light, which does not happen easily for any show, let alone a show like this, where you were tackling racism, queer issues in a way that was so beautiful and so rich. That does not happen in our culture. I can tell you this. If I called my tias and tias and wanted to have a conversation about queer issues, they would be like, uh, mija, I'm busy right sí, now, but I love you. But, but te quiero, mija, pero ahorita, ahorita no. A lo mejor <laughs> um, and you were like, no, I'm going head on. So what did it feel like when you got that? And then did you have a moment of, I can't wait to do this? Or was there ever a hesitation rooted in a little bit of fear in what that was going to do for this community? Because it's this kind of like unspoken, dark secret that we don't talk about. Well, that there wasn't that but there was uh, a fear of can I do it so it's always back to my own but that's just I think I'm always that's always going to be my process you know but can, I want to say that you know you were saying uh, right now that um there's not enough of us behind the camera in front of the camera there's not enough of us but I, I but when there are we champion each other's stories so I, the key here the formula that worked here was that the person that brought me into stars and sort of told me do you want to do a show about gentrification um, her name is Marta Fernandez. And that's the formula. Because she not only any time that like, I needed defending or championing in there, like, I would like an all Latinx writers room, I would like all Latina directors, I would like, like all fe um, female department heads when like, there was never a no it was she, I don't know what battles she had to fight there. But she like, it was like, it, 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 she had a, like a cultural duty, you know, I think she, she <laughs> felt it, you know? And so I felt very supported. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't easy. I mean, it took over a year or something to get it made, but like the way we made it was almost as important as what we made, mm -hmm. you know? And I think mm -hmm. that Marta had everything to do with it because I was a first time showrunner. I'd only been in Hollywood three years. I, and they, I, handed, they handed me a show. I, I, mean, know. I don't even know how to work final draft yet. Like, right. <laughs> that's the, the, the software for writing scripts. Yeah. I'm still like figuring that out. And, but I mean, I was a storyteller because I've 
done you know 16 years in Chicago of um, theater making but um but the fact that this woman saw this I, I they, that's the kind of chance that white men take on each other in this industry you know what I mean so all the time but it was there's there yeah. was a kinship here it was like you know and this is another thing usually for a baby showrunner they would give you um a babysitter you know like someone to walk mm -hmm. alongside you usually okay. like a white male that has done it you know somebody with experience and she made sure that I, I I was the boss you know like that I and but I think that's why Vida turned out that way because it was so I mean there's like a, a, a strong point of view because there was nobody else I was answering to except like you know artistically to the, the yeah. piece I don't know it was I'm mean, obviously we don't have the show anymore. I mean, it's it's gone, but it. I I know. I can't. I've I, come to London to make peace with it, but <laughs> but but it. But it. Uh, you know, we made it with so much love, and I feel like we made it right every season. You know, those girls, those actresses. I mean, I, um, the woman who played Emma, uh, Michelle, Michelle. She'd never been in a I know movie or TV show either. So like, all of us were like, we were ready but we had never done it. And the fact that like, th just the network took a chance on all of us, you know? Yeah, no, it was, yeah. it was beautiful to see. It. And, you know, having somebody like Marta is, is so, like, I'm gonna call Marta, like it just in the general, yes. like everybody, everybody yes. needs a Marta. a Marta. Yes, agreed. So as, you know, young women who are watching this and even women, you know, that are trying to pivot and do something different, how do we find that support in our lives? Like, you know, for whatever reason, you know, the universe put you and Marta together and gave us this gift of that beautiful team. And Vida was the product of that. But if we are looking for Marta, how do we find our own lives to champion and shepherd? And like you said, fight those battles for us because oftentimes it's not the battles that happen right in front of your face when you get to see them no. defending you. It's the stuff that happens behind the scenes that they might not tell you about. And you wanna know that that person has your back right in front of you and also when you're not in the room. So how do we build those relationships with other women? What has been your experience and, and what can we do to do more of that for each other? Because I think we especially need it, not just as women, but especially as Latinx men and women. Agreed. I, I mean, follow your gut. Cause sometimes it's not someone like that has as, as much access as Marta did. Sometimes it's mm -hmm. just like, um, when I started with a group of, 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 of women, we were all writing, we were on the same level, we just supported each other. And our career started to do this. And then they would pull each other up. And we would pull each other like, it, it, yeah. but it was like, we started sort of from the same, like, uh, level of it, like what we were aiming for the same thing, you know, so like, I feel like there's, it, it doesn't have to be necessarily, oh, there, I don't have a mentor, or I don't right. have, you can hold on to your sisters, for lack of, of say, make a sisterhood. I. Yeah. Every every step of the way, I've made a sisterhood. I started a theater company called Teatro Luna, the first all Latina theater company, um, back in early two thousands. You know, right out of college, um, and uh, it was we we had a really good run of like just creating theater. It had not, you know, we had not had Latina theater company like that before, and it, it was, you know, and then. Um, now I, I started this um, Untitled Latinx project, which is almost, almost all the Latina showrunners in Hollywood. And we get together and we have like a sisterhood. And like, we, um, I don't know if you saw, we launched a letter. Um, oh, to I yeah, saw the letter. I, yeah. I read the letter, saw the letter, and I was like, I'm going to go with Tanya Saracho behind the scenes, making this happen. <laughs> read three and more paragraphs other people, yeah, but, yes yeah. and read a couple more paragraphs i'm like yep there she is <laughs> but like that group was pivotal at making it happen i mean it was a lot of us at sign you saw it's yes. like 276 like almost 300 people yeah, yeah but no latinx creators they're all writers like, working in hollywood do you know what i mean from yeah. lin manuel to you know uh, staff writers like we're all of us you know so that but but but, but all those are examples of like sort of sisterhood um Totally. supporting and holding each other up and, it, and it, it's not just like somebody holding me up like we hold each other up you know pulling yeah. each other up and I I believe it in action like I'm not just talking I that is why I'm here I mean yes Marta who had access but also you know my sisters you know that that I, I you create that community and um of like-minded people um I, I really do think it's worked historically it's worked you know that's how movements have happened um yeah. and I think this is a movement that needs to happen access to us like you know, access and opportunity to our stories and letting us be at the helm of those freaking stories too. Like that, it's so funny. Cause like when I first started saying that, like people were like, it's so radical. 
why is it so radical? Yeah, why? I don't understand why it's so radical for us to tell our own stories. Like that, that I've never, you know, it's because it just hadn't been, I hadn't, you know, hadn't been happening for a long time. I mean, I mean, it's been happening. I feel like this last decade, people are getting, it. you know, okay, we should yeah, and, do that. But. And I also think not only are they getting it, but I think um, audiences are seeing the magic of what happens when you let brown and black yes. people write those stories direct those stories, be in those stories. And then it doesn't matter what color you are watching that story. Oh yeah. We, we are moved by connection and authenticity. And that's what you're getting on our screens right now. We're living in like some of the best TV times because like you said, they're letting other people tell those stories, thankfully. And I yes. think it's only going to get better. And I also think one of the things that I love about you is that your production company is called Chingona Production. Chingona Production. Okay, yes. so not, not everybody watching Makers right now knows what the word Chingona means. Uh, what does it mean to you? Because it's a word that I use with great affection and I think a lot of the women in my life embody what it means to be Chingona. But I wanna know from you, Tanya, what does that word mean to you? Chingona is a battle cry. Chingona is a you know, descriptor. Like Chingona is so many things, but it just means badass woman. Or if you use the B word, badass B. You know, like a badass it, it just B. Jefa, like a boss ass lady um, that sort of has agency over her life. And or I mean, it doesn't mean like right away you're you fix all the problems, but it's like you it's like your go getter. I don't know. It used to be a bad word, you know. When we oh were yeah, up, it was like you couldn't say it. I think when I told my mom that. <laughs> That's what I was naming my production company. <laughs> she was like, Ay, Tanya, que mal hablada. <laughs> it's fine. Now Ay, we've, mommy, taken, yeah. Ay, mommy, we've taken it back, you know, kind of like bitch. Like we've, ta we've taken is. these words back. Uh, um, I, and it's I love that. beautiful. Yeah. It is. And, you know, I think like if that's the spirit that's driving your production company, it helps me really understand why you've been able to tackle, you know, these issues, whether, you know, it, it's stuff that, things in our culture that we've normalized that are wrong, um, racism, you know, like I said, um, homophobia, sexism right. in our community. Right. And you had the cojones to just like tackle that head on, but you did it in such a delicate way that was still, because I think, you know, I think people can change, but they're not going to change with like heavy force, especially I think about the conversations that, you know, I've tried to have in the last six months with members of my family that, you know, I'm here to be anti-racist. That is, that is why I am here. And that starts at home. And I think about the conversations I've had with them and, you know, I kind of push them into your show because I think once they start understanding those characters more and they connect with that because they're like, oh, well, I don't have people in my life that are like that. I'm like, well, you probably do. Yeah. You probably do. Yeah. Um, but you tell their stories so beautifully. Um, and then at the end of the day, I always think that especially... Latinos, we, we're so rooted in community and family, yeah. and there's something so beautiful at the core of that. We just have to get around all the toxic masculinity that exists in our culture. And, and it's really, real. I mean, it's, it's real. It's real. Yeah. It's real, and it hurts our little boys and as much not as not just it, men. Yeah, no, we carry no. it too sometimes. We yeah. carry it, and, yeah. and you know, I find myself like saying certain things. Like, I remember I said to my mom like two years ago, I said, Why did why was it okay for y'all always to tell me? Calladita te ves mas bonita. Mom, that is destructive shit. What were you thinking? And she's she, like, you know, she's like, you know what, mija? Like, when I heard well, my, my abuelita, she's like, when I would hear abuelita say it or your tia Blanca, I don't know. I just, it's one of those sayings that we just say. And I didn't mean it. I'm like, right, but mom, that is in my head. Like, I remember being in school and they'd always be like, Liliana, you talk too much. And then I would go straight back to, oh, calladita right. My abuelita me. told me, calladita te ves mas bonita. I better be quiet. But it also um, muscled her too, I bet. You know what I mean? Like, it, even if she said she didn't mean, like, it did affect because it's a spell. Like, it's a spell that you say. It's a, it's a, it's like a kind of prayer. I, I have this button that says, no mami, calladita, no me veo mas bonita. <laughs> because right. it's, it's, it's damaging, especially to us in our community that to be told, you know, um, those things. And then we do, and then we're fighting that. I'm always fighting my parents. I, I have, um, I have a very, like, um, like my mother, is humble and meek and doesn't want to take up space. And my father's just too much, you know, and, and, and all those two, but they're like a lot of the time they're like telling me how to be a woman or how to, you know, mm -hmm. and I like, especially for creative stuff, I just have to take them out of the way, take them. Cause it's, it's, it's I mean, a they're your parents, they're your parents, yeah. you know, right. they're going to be, it's really difficult. They're your, 
traditions, your culture, um, that that's like a like it, they kind of become a burden. I mean, you love them, but like it kind of become a burden because like it because of those things that you're saying, you know, like absolutely. Uh, I, talk, by the way, I I love talking to you, and I got carried away in Spanish. They don't know what calladita te ves más bonita. Oh right, 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 right. <laughs> This is what happens when you get through Mexicana's like in a room yeah, yeah, like yeah. this. Okay, so calladita te ves más bonita basically translates to yeah. you look prettier when you're quiet. Like mouth zipped, don't say anything. And Wait, that is... There's like, should be seen, not heard or something. There's like a yeah, similar, like, like... It's almost like, oh, because people say like children should be seen, not heard. It's but like, this is gendered. This is this like... This is gendered, new, meaning little girl. Little yeah. girls, because... Of course, you have the masculine and the feminine with the A. So calladita really only applies to little girls. Mm -hmm. Calladita, quiet little girls. You look prettier. Um, and that's kind of what we, I, at least that's what I was told growing up. It's this yeah. saying that like our aunts and our grandmothers said to us. And like I said, it, it's bad shit. And we shouldn't be saying that to our girls. Really? We shouldn't have little boys listening to us say that to little girls. And that's what you're fighting for. And I think that's what all of these brilliant creatives and storytellers are, are fighting for is to yeah. be done with that because we can be done with all of that stuff and still embrace what makes our culture so rich and right. rooted in heritage. Like I remember you did, um, there's a scene in Vida where she does a baño, Olimpia, con el huevo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I remember seeing my el huevo, do that. Sí. And, like, You rub an egg all over uh -huh. you and like, cleanse yourself. I had never seen that on television. And my husband, who is honorary Mexican in Puerto Rican, was like, is that the egg thing that you were telling me about? I was like, yes, honey, that's it. He's like, that's so cool. I've never seen that on TV. I said, neither have I. Oh, no, there's so, you know, that's erasure. That's cultural erasure. We like when I it, never thought of it like that. Omission, omission is erasure. You know, it's really damaging because that that is a huge cultural like touchstone mm -hmm. for us, right? Or for, for, I'm going to say for, for a lot of Mexicans and Mexican Americans and people of that, you know, uh, uh, and Central Americans maybe too, yeah. um, but maybe, maybe not, not Caribbeans and stuff. I think that they're different kind of limpias, you know, um, but to, to keep that away from the narrative is so, you know, right now I'm, I'm trying to develop this show called Brujas, right? Because I'm obsessed with brujeria um, obsessed. and the obsessed and, um, um, what I want to do is I want to decolonize magic because Hollywood has been, has taken the European notion of, of magic, even the, the costume of a witch, right? It's like this mm -hmm. Victorian era corset. That's like, that's even the, yeah. the, the silhouette of a witch is European, the European, based, right? Yeah. And, and, and it's, you know, and when we think of a witch, it's like, she's like, you know, fair skin and red hair, whatever, you know, through running through the forest. There are Yoruba and indigenous, like, like traditions that are older than this uh, the pagan stuff. Not that it doesn't exist. I'm just saying Hollywood has taken practical magic. Harry Potter takes place yeah. in a British uh, <laughs> boarding school, for God's sake, you know? Yeah. Um, the uh, the craft, well, the craft was crafted. Like that, that's not real magic, but like it's all based on that. And we've been practicing for millennia, but we, we, where, where is are, it? Yeah, and where? also anytime they talk about our belief systems, like let's say they might, and it says religion, but let's say Santeria, it's like, they talk about oh they kill chickens so it's a it's a religion like respect mm -hmm. our our belief systems you know yes. it is it is really upsetting so I'm trying to like decolonize that yes. notion of magic I, you know I love that I mean I was I, I had a temascal for the first time <sighs> in my life and it was led by <laughs> a, a woman and she's like fourth generation in her family and I loved her story so much and her story has stayed with me from that moment like we connected on a level that took me back further back than like I even realized I was connected to the yeah. earth and to this and to that country. Um, and I agree with you. There's so much power and, and magia in what that is because it's all matriarchal traditions, right? It's right. all what it's wisdom of a lot of it, wisdom of women, you know, because we've been midwives, we've been uh, these healers for forever, and then. I think Christianity kind of came and, and stripped all that away. It, but we, girl, it snatched, it just snatched yeah, it and, away. And, and, you know, it just said, it's like, yeah, whatever. It, it's, it's time to take it back. And I do think a lot of um, millennial women are rekindling their relationship with, th with that spirituality, but that form of spiritual, like old matriarchal lines, like that go back thousands of years. And I think that's really beautiful. People are really connecting with that. I mean, I think so. if you don't want to call it brujeria, if you don't want to call it magic, whatever you want to call it, but it's that like, 
uh, more knowledge of the earth, more knowledge of, of, of energies, you know, like reconnecting with that, like pre-Christian stuff is, I think, yeah. really I, important so, <laughs> for me, so, so, at least. So, anyway. Now, I know I have to let you go, but I want to ask you another question about your overall deal. Uh, yeah. with Universal Content Productions, because I think this is going to be a game changer. Talk to us a little <laughs> bit about what what this means, not just for you, but what this means for this next gen and this next era of, of creatives and, and creators, specifically Latinx creators. So I, I, I want to just say something about my executive. They let me, they gave, you know, they're funding a, a development executive to run my company. And she's oh, Latina. She's, I know. And she's oh. Latina. And, uh, you know, uh, some people, who, like, there's not a lot of Latinas in this, you know, uh, at the helm of these things. So she, uh, you know, I'm super excited about that. And um, and just all, the, I'm partnering, like, I'm supervising some things, being an EP and partnering with, you know, uh, uh, well, right now it's all Latinas. And, um, but, I, you know, we're still, we're still forming uh, the thing. And what I'm most excited about is this uh, Latinx incubator, uh, this lab that we're creating. Oh, and that's like, there are holes of like, um, in, in, in the industry of how we can get in. So like, sometimes we can't, we don't have that, like, uncle in the industry that can like, get us at the, you know, mm -hmm. so it's really hard to get in. So there, there will be there will be a phase that serves that, then um, a lot of us get stuck doing as writers, the same level, because they, they, they yeah, don't yeah. value us. And they just keep putting us on the same writing level. And so it will address that. And then also, um, uh, there's going to be like a showrunner component so we can get showrunners ready for it. So like the whole thing is going to, I'm so excited by it. And, and so proud of you. Universal oh content is putting their money where their mouth is by like funding this. And that, that, that feels like a moment, like of the moment, oh. you know? So it's really exciting. It's really exciting. Well, we, we are so, so proud of you. And I know everybody watching um, is, is so proud of you. And we're so excited to see what Thank comes you, next yeah. from your brilliant mind. Um, and I know you have some action items for people watching and, oh, for yes. the women, and for our makers audience. What are some of the action items? Because we are ready to get on Team Tanya. Whatever you ask, we are here to do it. it and and it, it's not um, entertainment related. It's uh, matter. Hurricane, Hurricane Iota related. Yeah, right now we are, our Central America... Nicaragua, sobre todo, is struggling. Yeah. So I just wanted, um, if you could go to globalgiving.org. Yeah, I'm going to type it in as a comment. Globalgiving.org. Yeah. Uh, they are uh, providing emergency relief and support for Nicaragua, Honduras, este, Guatemala. And we, there hasn't been enough coverage, you know, there about no this. And they're struggling. Yeah. There has never been a uh, hurricane this bad uh, to hit Nicaragua. And that's saying something. Because... Uh, Ida was just there. So, yeah. um, uh, Eta, Ida, como se diga. But yes, yeah, so that's just something that I wanted to throw out there. Please. You are so, so, I can tell you this. We can rally our troops at Makers to make something happen. We have the most, like, oh, community-minded, um, action-oriented, passionate people that watch. Um, so, you guys, if you're watching this, please go to the website. I pinned it right at the bottom of our conversation. It's globalgiving.org. Really, or any, you, any, any, like any, Red Cross, anything. Exactly, yeah. anything that's going to help. But if you need direction, some people just need to be pointed in the one direction. There's your direction right there. It would make the biggest difference in the entire world. Um, Tanya, I just have to say thank you. I have wanted to do this interview for so long. I loved it. Um, I hope that this is one of many interviews to come. And I hope that our paths will cross very soon in LA one day. I don't know when like, you're coming back, but no I hope COVID. you're coming back. Like, February, maybe. Okay. When they kick me out of here. <laughs> um, when there's a vaccine. When there's a vaccine, I will I'll see be you. Um, yes. And I can't wait to see what you do. Best of luck with everything. We are your champions, your fans, and your, and your true supporters. Um, live it up in London while you can. I know <laughs> on you lockdown. Are on <laughs> lockdown. But listen, you never know what happens. I, some ideas are brewing. I can see it. Ex yeah. yeah, exactly. Um, but we will see you very soon. Stay in touch with us. And thank you all of you for joining and spending your afternoon with us and continue to support your black and brown creatives and creators however you can. Watch their stories on YouTube. Watch their stories on their Instagram TV. It starts small and then it becomes a movement like Tanya said. So thank you all. And Tanya, thank you so thank much. You. Gracias, and Muchas gracias. Bye. Ciao.